music videos, you're thinking marketing, you're thinking all of these other things that I, you know, most people as a normal listener, you don't realize goes into all of it. No. You know, people just think, oh, okay, you sit down at your computer, you know, record a track and then just put it out on Spotify and poof, you know. <laughs> It's episode 13 of Inner Sleeve, the podcast giving you a behind-the-scenes inside look at all things music. Frank Pavan, Joe Pacheco from Sound Mojo on the call today. Gentlemen, how's it going? Awesome, dude. Pretty good. Can't complain. Second week already. Things are moving quick. I know. Moving definitely quick. good responses to the new format. Um, we're glad that everybody's responding to it well out there. And today's guest is actually breaking new ground for us. She's calling in all the way from Singapore, Tabitha Nauser, who you probably know from Singapore Idol. She's had her own radio show um, and some awesome new music that's about to come out. Really cool to talk with Tabitha just about her perspective and also the music market over in Singapore. I don't know about you guys, but I definitely wasn't familiar with this and I learned a lot this episode. Same year, man. Like uh, I know a bit of obviously the uh, the BTS and all the um, mm-hmm. K-pop stuff, but I really enjoyed her sound. I enjoyed uh, her music and uh, what she had to bring, what she said. Yeah, yeah. She very very unique. Obviously, you spoke about K-pop and how you got late to it, but it's a huge thriving um, genre out, out massive. east. Yeah, massive. And another thing that was interesting was and something we got to preach to, to those who are in the digital media world or just in music, uh, the music industry. No overnight success, no instant rise to fame, even if you were on a show like Singapore Idol. Just, yes. You know, and it was tough for her to continue her traction. She had to commit time. And, and I think you said even capital, you know, people got to work mm-hmm. to support their music career. So anyways, it was a really, really good chat. And, I, and I, I'm, I'm sure the viewers will enjoy it. Definitely. You know, like this is this is her life's craft and you can really tell that that she's put every aspect into this that she possibly can. She has a great team. And without further ado, I want you guys to go check out this interview. So enjoy my chat here on Inner Sleeve with Tabitha Nauser. I'm really enjoying uh, the latest project. Um, you know, there's something I noticed about it that I thought was really interesting. It it sort of seems to explore a lot of themes that, from a female's perspective, are maybe not as often explored in music. Um, that was one of the first things I wanted right. to bring up. Talk to me about sort of what went into that for you. I'm curious. Um, I think for me, I, I draw a lot from, you know, personal experience. And for me, I started doing music um, well, I mean, I, I, I guess the whole thing that kicked it off was me doing Singapore Idol, which was a right. reality singing TV show. Um, and I did that at 16. So for me, you know, going into it at the beginning, not really knowing how the whole industry worked and, you know, what it was about, um, you know, I kind of had to figure things out along the way. And I think that's where I draw from a lot of um, the messages in my music. Right. When I write, I write about the things that, you know, you know, what happened at the start and, you know, how I'm try- still trying to figure out who I am as a woman, as an artist. Um, yeah. How do I want to convey myself to the world, basically? And so that's sort of where I get a lot of my stuff from. Um, yeah. Very yeah. cool. That's awesome. No, I mean, in Singapore Idol, you were 16. That was about that was a third season, correct? That was the third season. Yeah. Okay, cool. So talk to me about that. That must have been a a pretty massive turning point in your career. So it was very interesting. So when the third season came about, it had been a while between the second season and the third. So that was during the time when, you know, reality singing, like TV shows like that was still a huge thing. Mm -hmm. And so because it hadn't been around for a long time, when the third season, you know, was announced, people like lost their minds. They were like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. And so I remember being super nervous when I joined. And like I said, you know, I was 16, 17, didn't really know anything about the music industry. I I had done a small few competitions here and there, like Mm -hmm. that my mom was like, go do, you know, go have fun, go try it out. Like a talent Um, show or something like that. Yeah. Just like random talent shows, like at school or whatever. And so that was the extent of the music industry when I was joining. That's all I knew. Right. Okay. And so going into it, 
it was very interesting because people they loved the idol series they were avid fans of it and so everybody here in singapore was watching that show so yeah. you, you like people became overnight sensations from watching you know for being on the show mm. um and for me that was really like i was just kind of like wow um this is a lot to process of because course because at the end of it when you're in the competition you're kind of like in this little bubble so you don't really notice what's going on outside but once you leave and i left i was the second runner up so i i got third place right and so i went quite far into mm -hmm. the competition and so when i left and then started going back to school and doing all of that you know normal stuff Right. It was weird because everywhere I would go, people would know my name and they want to take a picture. They want to do this. And it was like, it was very overwhelming for me. And I was like, wow, this is, I don't know if I can handle all of this. Um, but after that, you know, it's like a couple months after that, the hype died down. It so did. nothing. Yeah, it did. So nothing really, I, I don't feel like anything really came out of that. Um, hmm. You know, it's not like I was getting like, you know, a job straight off the bat or endorsements right. or anything like that. I went back to school and finished up school. And then after that, I was like, oh, OK, well, what do I do now? Right. Because, <laughs> like you know, many the people hype think. died down. Yeah. Yeah. And I kind of had to, you know, build up from scratch again and try and, you know, put that foot back into the industry and try and figure out how to navigate my way. Um, and yeah, it was, it was, it was tough. I think a lot of people just assume that, oh, because you were on TV, like you just go, like, everything's just going to fall into your lap. And it's not like that most of right. the time. Right. Um, you kind of have to work your butt off and figure out <laughs> where you want to take, you know, your career and what direction you want to go in. And so that was kind of my thing. That's how I, it wasn't like an overnight sort of situation for me. I kind of had to mm -hmm. slowly, you know, take baby steps and work my way up. Wow, that's yeah. that's actually interesting. So, did you expect for it to fade away when all this hype was happening, or were, were you were you more so prepared to just keep it going? Because I mean, obviously you have it now, but at the time it was a different yeah. sort of hype. Yeah, um, I don't know. Actually, I'm not really sure what I was expecting out of it. I think, hmm. you know, I think everybody initially would be like, oh yeah, it would be great because now I get to do all of these other things outside of it. But I think for me, I knew like I had to go back to school. Like my parents were like, you know, I don't care what you do. <laughs> you need to go right. back to school, finish your education. And so for me, it was always like, okay, after that, I'm going to do school and then, you know, get that over and done with. Um, so I wasn't really thinking, yeah, I think I just, in the back of my head, I guess I always assumed that like, yeah, okay. Um, after school i would have to do this and this and this and then try and get back into it right yeah so it, it, i mean it would probably be hard to sit and think what's going to happen when you're in the thick of it right because you're probably just trying to assess everything that's coming at you at that time maybe not thinking of the yeah. future even yeah 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 it's so funny now when you look back on it you're like oh okay yeah that's interesting but like you know when you're really in the midst of everything it's like oh my gosh and it was very overwhelming like i think you know, people like I've, I've spoken about this a couple of times before as well. I was like, wow, this is just it was a lot to process at the time yeah. um, because it was such a big show. And, and you know, everybody here, like they were obsessed with it. And so, yeah, it was just it was a lot. No, that, that sounds like a lot. I mean, in, in terms of Singapore, uh, Singapore culture, is it mostly mm. mus musicians and culture that's directly from the region or is it a lot of Western music and influences? Because it sounds like people are very invested in what's going on directly in the region. Yeah, that's true. Um, I think it's unique because in Singapore, obviously, you know, we're an Asian country and we're surrounded by Asian countries. So, you know, we take a lot from the region, but at the same time, Singaporeans also, you know, we listen to a lot of Western influences and we have a lot mm. of Western influences. So a lot of American music or UK music, that's kind of where like I would, well, for me personally, that's kind of where I draw a little bit of my um, inspiration from. Right. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, we're pretty diverse here. We listen to a lot of different types of music, different mm. languages of music. We're not constrained to just, oh, you know, we only listen to like Mandarin pop or right. K-pop or whatever, you know? 
That's yeah. interesting. So what are your thoughts on some of the other genres, such as K-pop, like the way that it's dominating in, in, in other regions? I think it's amazing. I think that's so cool. And if, you know, that can happen more to other countries and other languages, that would be really dope. For me, mm -hmm. I actually got into the whole K-pop thing pretty late. <laughs> right. I became I was, aware of it late also. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So for me, it was, you know, I was kind of late to catch on to it. But when right. I did, I became obsessed because everything is just so, you know, fine-tuned and, and done so well. And mm -hmm. um, it's hard not to like it. You know, yeah. it, even if you don't understand the language, I feel like, you know, with music, you don't have to understand it right. as long as it makes you feel a certain way. And if you can get into it, then, you know, that's it. And so totally. for K-pop, that was that was sort of yeah, I wish I had got into it a lot earlier, um, but I still do listen to it a bit now. And uh, yeah, it's fun. It's it's fun. Mm -hmm. Even if I'm not sitting and listening to every song, I, I find elements I enjoy in the videos yeah. and it just, there's, you know, all around, it's a pretty well done product. Um, you know, yeah. it makes me wonder about Singapore too, since you have more of that freedom and more influences from different countries, um, do you feel more free when it comes to making music in, in terms of what you can add in, in your influences? Oh, 100 percent. Yeah, right. I think I think for me, I, I, I have always taken the approach of not having to put any constraints on myself when I make the music that I want to make. Right. Um, and I have never felt that I needed that I needed to, 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 to break away from anything, which is mm. good. Um, and so music has always just been pure expression for me. And so if I feel something, that's the direction I go with. I don't even think about, oh, OK you know, I have to make it sound a certain way or like, right. you know, uh, it's just never been a thought for me. So I've always been pretty free in that sense. The more original and, and true to your original idea, the better, perhaps. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you also mentioned your parents being sort of fundamental when it came to the schooling, um, even after Singapore Idol. But you mentioned yeah. in an interview a couple of years ago that that you found out that music was your calling from your mom when you were about six years old watching her perform on television. Um, you know, yeah. obviously a, a huge compliment to your mom and something that she's probably carried with her. I'm, I'm curious about that experience and also how she's come to react to your music career as it's gone on. Um, my parents have always been very supportive, both my mom and my dad. Um, and so I, I think in the beginning <laughs> when I used to sing, they would take it sort of as like, oh, the, you know, she she can sing. That's pretty nice. You know, it's a nice little hobby. <laughs> um, but as I got older, I think I started showing signs of wanting to take it a little bit more seriously. And my mom, I think, I guess, you know, she must have caught on to that, like motherly instincts or whatever. So she'd like slowly nudge me into the direction. I was extremely shy okay. um, young when I was younger. And right. so it, it, you know, she had to kind of nudge me a little bit. And I'm glad that she did um, because I think, you know, if I didn't have that, maybe I wouldn't be here. Hmm. because I would have been too shy and I wouldn't have come out of my shell. Right. Um, so, so yeah, I, my mom used to be a singer um, and she, she's Indian. So she would do Tamil songs. So she was a Tamil oh. singer and on TV. And so I, when I was growing up, we would have like video cassette tapes of all of her shows and we would put it in and just watch it. And I was like, Oh, that's hmm. so cool that that's, you know, a job, like that's something yeah. that you can do for a living. To me at the time, the concept was weird. I was like, Oh, okay. You can go to work and love what you do. This is, this is crazy. <laughs> what is this madness? Um, <laughs> yeah. What is this? What? <laughs> um, so yeah, it was. And then, you know, the more I, I, I got into it, I really enjoyed it. And so, um, I'm happy, like I'm, I'm really lucky and happy that, you know, I've had a career over all of these years and I still get to do it now today. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, it's just exciting because I feel like there's still so much more to do. Um, and that's what I'm excited about. And I think that's still what drives me till this day. Yes, definitely. D does your mother still sing at all? <laughs> she sing. no, she doesn't do like, you know, the big TV stuff anymore, but she does sing like at home by herself. So, so now it's a hobby for her and, and a job for you. Now it's exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's so funny how the tables have turned. 
That is that is a quite interesting, actually. Um, you know, another thing yeah. I wanted to know about was turn up with Tabitha in the afternoons. Um, a lot of people might know ah. you from that. What can you tell people about that? Oh my gosh! Um, so, well, okay. Let me just talk you through what I was thinking at the time. So after I had finished school and after I'd done the whole idol stuff, I was trying to find a way to, you know, slowly get back into the industry in a way that people would be like, oh, okay, I remember her. Right. Um, and so I was like, definitely, I still wanted to be music related. And at the time, um, you know, I was still in, in, in my head and in my mind, I was like, I still want to go out there and live my life a little bit, get a couple more experiences. And then I can, you know, write something that means something to me. Right. Um, and so I was like, okay, let's try this radio thing. Let's, you know, see if that could be an avenue that would be exciting to me. And so I did. And then I ended up um, hosting Singapore's first ever, which is crazy to me, first ever hip hop and R&B sh show. So it was just purely that. Nice. Um, and so for like three, was it three or four hours a day, um, I would sit in there and just play songs that I loved and then shared it with people and then talk about, you know, tracks that, you know, were out and, and all of that kind of stuff. And, and it did well. And it made me fall in love with music even more because hmm. I got to talk about music every day and also, you know, find out a little bit more about the history of things. And it gave me a lot of inspiration at the time. And then I think I was there for two or three years doing that show. And then after that, I felt like the time was right. I got signed um, and I was like, okay, I am going to bounce now and I'm going to focus a hundred percent on music. Yeah. Okay. So, but I mean, that's better than working at, you know, like a lot of people at a regular minimum wage job while you're making that transition. Yeah. Yeah. So again, like I said, super lucky that I got, you know, how things have fallen in place and how I get to, you know, kind of transition into this music career and to be able to do it full time as well. Yeah. Um, because, you know, it's hard. And I think a lot of people, even now still, there are a lot of people that have to kind of, you know, have multiple jobs in, in order to be able to fund and to support their music career. And so I've been really lucky in that sense. I, like, I, I, I guess for me, I did it the other way around where I kind of, you know, hustled for about three years, saved up as much money as I could and then went, okay, now I'm going to use all of that on mm. my music. Um, so yeah, there are multiple different ways that you can do, go about doing it. I'm starting to think that's the way to go though, because it, I mean, it takes yeah. a lot more money than people realize to be an artist and yeah. it's, it's important to have that capital. Yeah, for sure. I think, I think for me, because I started out as, um, a signed artist. So my first ever debut single was as a signed artist. Right. And so at the time, I think I didn't really realize just how much money was going into everything because, yeah. you know, I had the label kind of be like, OK, well, we need, you know, how many number of, of, of songs from you just deliver those songs. And they handled all of the back end stuff mm -hmm. after being with Sony for three years and then coming out as an independent artist that I think that was when I really realized, OK, wow, you know, there is all of this that goes into you know, creating a body of work and a project that you're proud of, because you're not just thinking about the music. You also have to think about, you know, what's going to support that. So you're yeah. thinking um, music videos, you're thinking marketing, you're thinking all of these other things that I, you know, most people as a normal listener, you don't realize goes into all of it. No, you know, people just think, oh, OK, you sit down at your computer, you know, record a track and then just put it out on Spotify and poof, you know, <laughs> there. Right. You just upload it to Spotify out. without any third party yeah. service. Or... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's what they, people exactly, think, though. But there's <laughs> there's so much more behind it. Um, and so it's been, you know, a very interesting I would say like two years for me as an independent artist, especially coming out of um, a major label. Uh, right. It's been, you know, very mind broadening and just, mm -hmm. you know, a, a lot of, you know, trial and error and trying to work things out. But I'm happy with how we've we've gone about it so far. Um, yeah. I've put out a debut EP. Um, which was called Things I Should Have Said in 2019. Um, so, yeah, it's just, 
very exciting. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's, it's awesome. And it's, it's so interesting how your career progressed in in a very unique way. And I think that that's what helps make for a very unique product. Um, you know, I'm yeah. curious about what it's like for an artist from Singapore talking about, you know, how, how your region welcomes a lot of outside music. What's it been like for you trying to break into the North American market, especially as an independent artist and in, in a different way? Uh, has that been easier than expected, harder than expected? You know, it's 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 hard. It's going to be hard. Right. Because we're coming like I'm based here in Singapore. It is such a tiny, tiny country. I don't think people realize how small it is. It doesn't even show up on a map. That's how small it is. Right. right. We've only got a population of like, what, five point eight billion people. So it's tiny. Um, and, you know, I think the biggest thing is how do you get awareness um, outside of the, the country. I think for me, I've had sort of that nice, um, build up with my previous label, um, to be able to have awareness in the region. So in that sense, it's been good, but trying to, you know, break into the UK and the U S or even the Australian market is a completely different ball game. I think ideally I would like to be, um, closer to those countries or even based in those countries. Um, Mm -hmm. we talked about it, uh, you know, moving to the UK last year, but then of course COVID, of course. (laughs) So then plans change. Right. Um, so, you know, it's, it's been tough. I do see a bit of headway now that, you know, we've, um, you know, become independent artists. Um, and, it's yeah, but it's taking a lot of work and I think it's definitely going to take a little bit more time. Um, but yeah, yeah, I'm hopeful. And I think it would be best if I could be there. Right. Um, so we'll see how it goes with this whole, like, you know, COVID situation. Totally. <laughs> so the UK is, is kind of where you're looking at. I think it's, well, for me, it's just, you know, situation wise, it would be best because it's like right smack in of America and Singapore. So it's easy for me to go back right. if I need to. Um, and so I just thought that that would be a good base. Uh, just, you know, if I need to fly anywhere. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah. And also um, I have done, well, early last year, I did writing camps in the UK and the US. And so it's nice because now if I do go back, I do have you know, a few producers that I can just be like, Hey, I'm in the Mm -hmm. country. (laughs) Do you want to do a session together? And they're super nice and super chill guys. And it's just nice to be able to have that and just go in and, you know, spontaneously, you know, create something, um, without having the pressure of like, Oh, I need to have a single done. Right. Um, So, yeah. It it must be nice to be able to have the ability to make those decisions though, because I know with labels, they, they, they have, you know, sometimes a lot of deadlines and a lot of expectations of you in a specific way. Yeah. I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. Hmm. Um, I think for me, <laughs> especially because sometimes I do need a little kick in the butt because otherwise I will take my own sweet time <laughs> because I do like to tweak things. And sometimes I do a little bit too much tweaking and I'm like, okay, Um, so it's, it's nice to have that, but I think it's a good balance. I definitely do prefer being able to make the decisions for myself. Um, and I like being able to plan, okay, so this is when we're going to be working on a track. This is when it's going to come out. This is how we're going to roll out our promo plan and all of that kind of stuff. So Mm -hmm. it's nice to be able to have that direct control and to be able to say, okay, could you help me with this? Could you do that for me? And I'll handle the rest of it. Yes. Um, yeah, I do. I I don't know. Maybe that's a bit of like um, yeah, me being like a micromanager or whatever. But I love it. I like no. being able to, you know, be a hundred percent involved. And um, I didn't necessarily feel that when I was with the label. Um, so it's nice to be able to do that now. Yeah, and that that's important again if you're making the type of music which you are, which is super authentic and you know revealing. And it you know it's obviously inherently would be a very personal process. So I guess you would want to have hands on during that process if if that makes sense. One hundred percent, exactly. Yeah. You know, I, I heard an expression that somebody said that making an album, it's never finished, and 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 it's interesting <laughs> to hear you say that that you often want to go back and tweak things. Would you agree with that? That is maybe can almost never feel completely finished. Yeah, I know it's so funny because I've heard that saying as well, and it's true. 
It's right. so true. And I think because as an artist, you're always evolving. And so your sound is always evolving. So now when I listen to stuff that I put out like three years ago, I'm like, oh, hang on a second. Like if I had just done this hmm. in the bridge, oh man, it would be like, it would sound like 10 times better or whatever. But I think, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Right. Because it just shows that you're developing as an artist and you're evolving and your sound is changing. So, and of course you always want to improve, but yeah, sometimes it can be a little bit frustrating because I, you know, if, like I said, if you've got deadlines and you're always just like, Oh my God, just let me do this one little tweak. Let me do just one more thing. Um, yeah, yeah. It's you, you never really finish it. And I guess that's why, you know, there's always album number two or album number three or four. Right. You can can make unlimited records, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it's like chapters in a book in a way almost. Um, Yes. Yeah. That's such a great, yeah. Yeah. No, it it makes sense. You mentioned hip hop. I have to go back to that for a second. Are you a classic hip hop person? Are you a modern Uzi young thug? What type of hip hop do you like? (laughs) Oh my gosh. Um, I'm kind of all over the board, if I'm being honest with you. Like I do appreciate, you know, the class six like Nas um and obviously Tupac and all of that kind of stuff but I do also like I like Drake a lot Mm -hmm. yeah (laughs) I like um I like uh oh man there's so many like I like Black um Mm. I love you know Janae Aiko like she's you know a bit hip-hop R&B um, I'm really all over the board. I kind of just right. listen to everything. Anything that catches my ear, I'm like, okay, yeah. Very cool. Any classical or rock? Yeah, honestly, if you were to look at my Spotify, like what I've listened to recently, it's just all over the place. I kind of right. just listen to anything and everything. And I think that helps because then I hear things that I've never heard before. And I'm like, oh, okay. So you can do this this way. That's interesting. Um, and I'm very inquisitive by nature. So I think for me, it's like, I'm always interested to see what else there is out there. Yes. And so I don't limit, I don't really want to limit myself. I think maybe when I was younger, yeah, I did. I was like, yeah, no, I only listen to R&B. That's it. Um, right. But now it's sort of like, you know, I really do want to see what else there is out there. So I don't really limit what I listen to. I listen to jazz. I listen to just classical music. Um, nice. Yeah. So it's just, it's everywhere, all over the board. That's awesome, though. And again, a, a great yeah. way to draw inspiration. Speaking of seeing what's next, what's next in, uh, for Tabitha in, in 2021? Ooh, very exciting. So the trip that I mentioned um, where I went to L.A. and, and um, the U.K., Yeah. I had done a whole bunch of writing camps there. And so we had banged out, you know, quite a bit of tracks. And so this year it's about getting them all, you know, you know, in their little packages and then dishing them out this year. So I'm very excited because if all goes according to plan, we will have quite a number of tracks to share um, this year. So I am just at the moment, I recently released Slow Down, which was my latest single that came out. So we're taking a bit of a break right now, just, you know, uh, a month, two months uh, to, you know, really think through the rollout process for the next couple of tracks. And then hopefully we'll have the next one out in May. Um, and then, you know, the rest will come. Uh, Slowly but surely. The the year. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, we're very excited about that. Um, yeah. I think for me, it's just like, I just want to put out as many tracks as I can right now. That's my right. goal. I want to be able to build up my catalog and to, you know, um, if, you know, new people are coming to, to listen to me, I want to be able to show them um, the, you know, because I feel like my music's pretty diverse. It's mm-hmm. kind of, you know, it has its roots in R&B, but at the same time, you know, I like to dabble in like Slow Down, for example, that's a bit more UK, like garage sounding, right. or like house sounding track. And I like to be able to play with those things. So I want to put out as much as I can just so that I can, you know, probably entice somebody. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and you will, it's, it's coming along great. And uh, thank you so much for your time. I, I really appreciate your insights yeah. and uh, keep doing the great music, you know? Thank you so much. It was lovely to chat with you.
awesome chat with Tabitha Nauser. Like I said, learned a lot and hopefully the listeners did too. I think there's a lot of good info in there. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, once again, just learning about new artists and foreign to us, but but if you just look her up on YouTube, on her YouTube channel, you could realize her, her music is is pretty banging. I'm not going to lie. Pretty, Absolutely. Pretty popping. <laughs> Yeah. Very good. And, and like I said off the top, you know, a, a unique perspective that you don't always hear from, you know, this sort of segment of pop music, which is always refreshing. You, you don't want to hear the same thing every time. Yeah, I, I enjoyed that when she mentioned that, like, people don't realize that it's not just I write a song, I produce it, I put it out and everything happens. Right. Like even on a major label, they mm -hmm. have, she had to invest, they have to invest so much money. So she got that. What's cool, she got that that nice window of opportunity where she can see how the label did it and having had that success and, and built her fan base from the show and then sort of losing it and starting over. Uh, and now she's doing it on her own. So she she has a bit of that, like, she got schooled a bit. She sees how you go about it and how you do it and how much effort and money it takes to just, even just to get recognized a little bit, you know? Exactly. Yeah. And, and once you put yourself in that position, it gives you the choice to have those options, which is really nice. That's it, you know, and she doesn't take stuff for granted, which you can tell. And at the same time, like I said, she she's about to work. She knows that there's, it, there's work. There is no overnight success. Yeah, definitely, definitely not. Couldn't Ho agree more. Hopefully it all works out with the relocation that she's talking about. I think once she gets into this market, the team's going to, you know, continue to blow up and appreciate the team. And we wish them all the best. Gearing into some topics, you know, this week actually has a lot of milestones in terms of music. One quick shout out, little anecdote. Happy birthday to Elton John. Uh, he is almost 70 today. years old now. Is it today? Yes. Uh, my, my math is not good, but it was like 1947. <laughs> okay, there you go. Now, he's just wanted 80. to say, he's almost 80, you know, still kicking ass. My favorite Elton John song, um, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. I don't know about you guys. I don't know if I can pick one. It's so hard to pick one, isn't it? I'm, st I'm still standing as a... Uh... Oh, that's a cool mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. That's a cool yeah. one Definitely. from the 80s. A lot of good ones for uh, sure. I would have to agree with Cass or Betty and the Jets. Mm -hmm. Or is it mm. Benny and the Jets? Benny. I always got that confused. Yeah. Benny and the Jets. Incredible. There you go. That song Still is like, like a weird dream, I think. It, it's, it's such a bizarre uh, experience just to hear it. So shout out to Elton John. Definitely love him. And actually another Rocket thing. Man. Also another thing that came out this week in history is Number of the Beast, the tremendous studio record by Iron Maiden. And Joe, you actually have a copy of this, Let's don't you? Let's see it, Joe. Let's see I it. I don't have the shirt anymore. <laughs> either way too big for it or, or it's diffused, but I still have the original vinyl. Oh, nice. Let's see that. Put it closer. For five bucks. I paid wow. five. Let's see if there's no... There we go. Oh, it's out of focus. Sorry. Right. Where'd you get this? In Montreal? <laughs> yeah, it looks good, man. It still, it still I, seems to be in good condition. It is. It's a very... And I listened to it just last night, you know, like, and I love... Yeah, hey, is that the show logo or what, what? What is that now? Yeah, that's, that's the like inner the sleeve show. logo on there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We need our own record labels. <laughs> <laughs> I love this record. Like I remember, it was the last day of elementary school, uh, grade six, pretty much. And I don't know how I had or why I had five dollars in my pocket because I never had any money in my pocket. <laughs> but I, I was walking home. I still remember there was a flea market there that would sell all kinds of stuff. And then I saw this album and I picked it up and was like, "Yeah, Iron Maiden on the Beast." I'd already known of this album for quite a few years and mm. like I love the band already. I got into metal and rock really early and uh, yeah, I'm so happy that yesterday this was the, uh, not yesterday, sorry, Monday was the, the anniversary of, of this album and I popped it in, listened to it while I was working and it's still incredible. It still yeah. holds up. It's, you know, and how can you not go for this record if you're a young metal fan? I mean, that cover, it just takes over your imagination and it's, it's such a wild thing. I remember this was one of the first rock and metal CDs I ever got and definitely my first Maiden CD ever. And I remember opening the little mini CD booklet because it wasn't the vinyl with the big one. And they have the picture of Eddie holding the devil's head. And I remember I put it like I like taped it to my wall mm -hmm. as a kid. And my parents were like, we don't want you to have this on your wall. And we didn't know that this was like this kid is seven. And I got Eddie in the devil's <laughs> head. I remember I think a, a friend came over and they got scared. But the fact that it was like sort of taboo i guess i didn't know what that word was at seven but it was like something i wasn't supposed to really look at it made me like it more i think that's natural for a kid i think so too it's also like uh knowing myself i heard it on the radio of all things a local montreal now it's a classic rock station here but like they played it and i i, I remember hearing this like wow the intro with the vincent price you know right of the beast insane and then like 
the riff and then it was bruce dickinson's longtime iron maiden singer uh but like it was his first album mm -hmm. and uh and wow. even the drummer is not the same drummer you know he left after this drummer and he passed right. away a few years ago uh clive burr you can hear the punk what i love about this this band like especially even killers the album before you hear the punk mm -hmm. the rawness of these guys totally. but then you hear the the maturity from the first album to this one and then like For me personally, Iron Maiden has like the first seven or eight albums are just masterpieces. It's not yes. many bands that can pull entire albums like that one after the other, you know? And look, today, they're still, what, selling out Rock and Rio, 300,000 fans? They formed in East London in 1975, guys. I mean... It's insane. Yeah. And and they're vastly different from the band that, that they started as, Joe. You're right. Like, I think the beginning Maiden and Killers and records like that, it sounds like they're in some back alley, you know, in the UK and like it's really yep. gutter. And then you're right. You hear it, it, they age like fine wine, Maiden. And, and you know, the fact that Bruce Dickinson can still hit those notes live is pretty insane to me. And put on a show. Like, I, yeah. I haven't seen them now. I think the last time I saw them a couple years back with mm -hmm. uh, even Dream Theater was, was co-headlining with them. Mm -hmm. And it's just... It's massive, like how how the fans like you go to this show and you'll see three generations for sure. Yes, you'll see the well, I, me, I was, my son, and let's say if my father was into it, you know, you'll see it. You'll see I it. was just gonna say, going back to what Cassius said about how, being seven years old and having their their record or what, what, it was the record CD, right? yeah, CD. I, I mean, I can't imagine they they would have imagined having seven year olds, um, <laughs> the, yeah, you know, even owning it or knowing music, what it but was. I mean, I, I could understand like the whole image that they put off is compelling right so absolutely eddie. basically you have eddie on every cover that's their mascot eddie yeah their sh live shows were incredible um were they one of those bands because obviously you guys know a bit more than me were they one of those bands we like ate the weird like ate stuff live on 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 no no, no. Right? i know of <laughs> no. not that gruesome not like not like, Ozzy eating not like wasp or, or but, Ozzy, but they yeah. have yeah. Their, their mascot like the guy on all the album covers they have like a life-size version of him that's like a person in a suit and it, he walks out and they like battle him on stage so they've okay. always done like wild theatrics and waving like the uk flag on stage So yeah, they, they've always been, but they've never been like Aussie level type okay. of thing. <laughs> yeah. I, I One thing I always like, I've always said about Maiden, especially growing up, listening to them since I was like you, seven, eight, nine, um, was I learned a lot of history mm -hmm. through Iron Maiden. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's a lot of topics. A lot of topics. those songs, you know, that bring you into history. Alexander the Great, Power Slave, the whole Egyptian thing. Like there's mm -hmm. so much, you know, uh, so much history that I learned or, you know, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. You know, I got into those type of poems or books. Through because Maiden. Those, because, yeah, through Maiden, for sure. Yeah, that, that's actually a great point. Lots of storytelling, lots of going back into history and definitely one of the most special bands to ever exist. You know, it, it we, we mentioned Maiden concerts. I remember the last time I saw Maiden was a couple years ago and I went all out because Frank, you mentioned, you know, they can't imagine probably having seven year olds listening to them. And I brought my Iron Maiden wall flag that's, you know, wider than me and I'm waving it, the big flag of Eddie and I was sitting near the front waving the flag and, you know, some of the older people were like, oh shit, you know, check this guy out. Nice. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but it, it just reminds me, you know, how much I miss concerts. Well, and that wasn't the last concert you went to, was it? That wasn't the last one. Actually, the last concert I went to uh, was Zach Wild and Black Label Society. Um, that night I was actually photographing the show and I was photographing a lot of shows at that time. So I hate to say it because now I have the perspective, but I think I might have been taking it a little bit for granted just because I'm in a big concert market and I was seeing so much. So I almost didn't go that night because it was so far and all this stuff. And I was like, you know what? I feel you. Yeah, seriously, it happens sometimes. I've been there, especially, you know, we're, ca we're Canadians, right? So it's minus it's 27. It's freezing, the exactly. Last thing, the last thing you want to do is like, do I really want to go? Especially if you get it for free. That's exactly. That's kind of like, what was, if you have to pay for your ticket. What was story. your last concert, Joe? Uh, two weeks before the lockdown, it was... Oh. Um, Canadian uh, meddler, one of my idols, is uh, Devin Townsend. I don't nice. know if you guys are familiar with familiar him. Familiar name, yeah. It's familiar. Uh, he's just a monstrous talent. I can't say enough about him. I'm going to ruin whatever I say if I try to talk about him. <laughs> But uh, the thing about him that's so unique is he does what he wants. Every album, you just almost don't know what to expect, but you know to expect Devin, right? Like, right. it's a big, crazy voice, whatever. Like, n nonsense of a range. Yeah. <laughs> uh, great guitar player, metal. But then, like... I guess the reason why I like him is he's quirky. You know, he, mm. he's, he, he'll pull, you'll be listening to like the hardest metal and then like have like Zappa-esque orchestral arrangements in the back. Nice. Anyway, this show was cool because it was a bit more stripped down. It was at a local club here, the Corona, and he did two nights here. Mm, at the and Corona? What's cool is that, yeah, 
I know, of all places. Yeah, of all places. Right? Right? Two yeah. nights before. <laughs> Quite a way to end it I off. Know, I know. Two weeks before. Two weeks before. Holy yeah, crap. Can I signal much? <laughs> it was the first time. You know, it happens. You know, like, I've been into this guy since the late 90s. And I never, I'm always busy or working a gig on the night that he's in town. So I always miss his gigs. Right. Uh, so I finally got to see this one. And it was everything I expected. And what's really cool is that. He does what he wants. He's so nonchalant with the audience. He has a conversation with the people. You can ask him questions. He'll answer you. He'll do nice. some crazy antics. Really interactive. Yeah, he, he had, chi- yeah, he had real children on stage singing at the end of the show with some of his. You know, it's, it's it was a great last concert to see. I have to admit, that's amazing. Frank, have you did did you see many concerts uh, or? Man, not the biggest. Uh... Not the biggest concert guy. Because I know the, you're the, a the, sports guy. That's that's really yeah. your your big passion. Yes, as you can see, base, so, baseball so, hat. There is a couple so what race was your car last track. Sporting event. Yeah. <laughs> um, the last sporting event was probably probably a hockey game. To be honest, that's just yeah. It's probably a hockey game. Habs. Me too. Something like that. Montreal Canadiens. But the last concert that I think I I was and not even really my music genre, but someone. Okay, I'll go on record right now, and I'm not a huge like I I'm the least knowledgeable about music here on this show, but. My last concert that I believe it was, I went to a John Mayer concert who, when he came mm-hmm. to Montreal on his on his album tour, on his new album same tour. Here. But that you went as well, Joe. No, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah that I was think good. We were at the same show. Yeah, Saturday probably. Night. Probably. Nice. Yeah. And but I also went to see Brendan Neary and Panic at the Disco. Oh, cool. Same. Might have might be one of the best vocalists today. He I, kicks I, ass. I. Wow, hundred percent. Because like I went in there knowing of this band for years, Panic yeah. at the Disco. Mm-hmm. I'd heard about him all the time. I had the same impression. I came away thinking this guy is something else. Wow. Yes, yes. He's no, really got vocal range. Seriously, Cassius, he's his vocal range from low to high in a split second. Um, yeah. v- versus multi 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 instrumentalist. Uh, nice. He, he has, he's the whole package. He did a, he did a great uh, Bohemian Rhapsody version. Yep. It was like, oh man, wow, he really went the there. Concert. That's that's yeah. ambitious. No, he's, uh, this, I was impressed, man. Like if I had any, I didn't have anything cause I didn't know anything to say about them before, but like, I'm a fan after yep. that show. Wow. Well, Hey, I'm coming away with a new music suggestion now. I mean, I, I haven't listened to much of them either. I remember the hits from when I was a kid, but I think most groups, if you dig a little deeper, you'll, you'll probably find something you like if it's up your alley. So probably worth it, you know? And yep. that also reminds me, speaking of the last concerts, if you guys are interested, we have a new series on Sound Mojo by Dre the Music Man. Incredible content, great guy. We love him here at Inner Sleeve. And make sure to check out his new video on Sound Mojo, my last show, where he talks about his last concert. Yeah, and if, I'll just say a few words. Like the idea of the whole series with Dre the Music Man is to what it's like to be a mu- modern music lover, listener. Right. right. Mm. So his first episode that we dropped, you can check it out. It's phone down listening. It's talking about putting your phone down, ignoring all those notifications, leave your emails behind, dedicate twenty minutes to listening to an album, a side of an album. Right. And it's it's a challenge. Mm-hmm. It's so funny because like who sits there and just listens to music nowadays? It's rare, you know. But I it's find rare. I'm more it's into it when I do. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. So like that was one. So this one, we're, which we're talking about, is what I miss most, which is basically concerts. He's right. an avid concert goer. You see all his tickets on the video in the beginning. And then he proceeds to break down a uh, Death From Above concert that he saw in the early 2000s. The whole experience. The house lights go down and two spotlights hit the stage. The crowd goes wild. The screaming is so intense. You could swear you've never heard anything so loud in your life. But as if bassist Jesse had heard your thoughts, he marches on stage and starts to adjust his volume knobs, almost to say, you think that's loud? Check it out. If you're into concerts, you you, you can relate totally. Definitely. Um, And then this week we have, uh, in two days, we have another video dropping that's going to be how songs can grow on you. Or in the Mm. sense of like playlist culture, right? You can skip the songs you don't think you're going to like on the album, right? Because the Mm -hmm. whole point of an album is to listen to the whole whole thing. thing and. And, you know, there's always some songs that are not as great as the, you know, the, the singles or whatever. Right. But then you have like the Maidens where every song, you love the album. Right. Some are stronger, whatever, but you take it for the whole thing. And that's kind of what he's saying, where if you can listen to a song three, four or five times, eventually you say, hey, there's something really cool about this song. And actually, I'm, I'm glad I stuck it out, right? That you didn't right. maybe hear initially. Yeah, that's really interesting, actually. Well, shout out to Dre. Yeah, so, anyways, that, so Saturday, right? Yeah, Saturday that's dropping, and like there's more to come, and maybe maybe we'll get him on the show uh, with us and sure. like, yeah. have some awesome conversations with him. He's a great guy. 
We'd love to do that. And also would love to know what you guys think of the content that we're putting out in terms of the new format here. It's been a lot of fun. We want to know the topics you guys want to hear. Of course, your guest suggestions. And there's a lot of different polls and things like that on the Sound Mojo community tab. So when you subscribe and hit the notification bell, make sure to go check out the community tab as well for Sound Mojo and all the things that we're putting out. And thanks for checking out Inner Sleeve. Shout out to Tabitha Nauser and everybody that made this possible. And thanks, you guys. We'll catch you guys on the uh, next episode. Peace, everyone. See you, man.